Hey, Tyler, have you ever wanted to make your own podcast? Absolutely, I have. Well, if you want to make your podcast, you should go to Anchor. It's the easiest way to make a podcast. Here's why. For one, it's free to use, no monthly fees. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer, so you don't need any of that special equipment. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership, and it's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. If Jeff and I can make a podcast using Anchor, literally anybody can. So, download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. The following podcast is a member of the Pokecasters Network. Pokecasters Network, supporting Pokemon content creators, their shows, and the community of Pokemon fans. To find out more, check out PokeCastersNetwork.com or find us on Twitter and Facebook. Hi everyone and welcome to episode 20 of the Pokemon Snapshot. How are you doing today, Tyler? I'm doing absolutely fantastic, I guess. You guess? Yes, it's just an I guess this week, because it's Sunday. Yeah, going to work is never fun, though. We did get to celebrate my daughter's fifth birthday party, and she did have a Pokemon-themed birthday party. I just want to point out, Jeff, that I think it is shocking that you've actually managed to keep a child alive for half of a decade. I know, I can't, I, I have no idea how I did it, but she is still kicking. I think I know how, and her name is Jessie. Maybe. Maybe that is true. But let's get on to our episode and let's get a few things out of the way first. If you want to talk to us about the episodes, make sure you tweet us at Pokemon Snapshot or you can email us at thepokemonsnapshot at gmail.com. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please give us a review. Tell us what you like about the podcast, what you think you would like to see changed, just so we can make this podcast better for you and our listeners. So, Tyler, are we ready to get into the episode? Oh, I'm ready to get started on this bad boy. Alright, so today's episode was episode 20, and it was titled, The Ghost of Maiden's Peak, or as they called it in Japanese, The Ghost Pokemon and the Summer Festival. I love Ghost of Maiden's Peak so much better. Like, that is such a better title. Yeah, and not to get into any spoilers, but... The title kind of spoils the episode. It kind of does, yeah. We're not going to say how, but we will talk about it when we get there. Uh, In Japan, this episode aired on August 12th, 1997. Which, you think they would try to get it air around Halloween? Because I know they celebrate that in Japan. And it this episode didn't need to happen in any place. They could have put it anywhere. That's true. Uh, And then in the United States, it aired more close to the season on October 2nd, 1998. That was the day before my birthday in 1998, Jeff. Yep, and I'm going to say next week's episode will probably air on your birthday because they aired one episode a day back then. Oh my gosh, next week episode would have aired on my 10th birthday then. That is amazing. Yes, so can't wait to talk about that. But, Tyler, let's talk about today's episode right now. Okay. We begin our episode with a large, creepy cliff jetting out of the water next to an equally creepy cliff with a house on it. At the top of the first cliff, we see a statue of a sad-looking woman looking out into the ocean. A ghost woman appears next to the statue and says, I've waited for you. Come back to me. Return to your beloved. In a creepy way. There's a red flower in the hair of the statue. As the ghost woman floats up, it turns into a ghastly, and the voice changes to a deep, manly voice, and it says, I'm waiting for you. Ha 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 ha. I'll get some real exorcist vibes from this intro, Jeff, with that whole voice change thing. Is it wrong that I hope Ash gets vomited on at some point in this episode? No, no, I think that would make it very entertaining. Uh, But I thought the beginning of this episode was a good change of pace because usually we have, you know, the narrator telling us what Ash and his friends are doing. And this one took a completely different turn. We didn't even start with Ash and his friends. 
I know. I, I love this intro. It's actually probably one of my favorite intros of the series so far. Uh, my other love is horror movies and horror everything, horror games, horror movies, all of it. Real big into that stuff, so I, I was digging this intro. We then flash to a ship that is carrying Ash and his party. It is now daytime, fortunately. As they are sailing, Misty spots a landmark. Ash says that it must be Maiden's Peak, and that is where they are due to get off the ship. He says that they must be landing soon. Brock then says, Ah, it wouldn't matter to me if I never saw land again. I just wasted another summer. Two things. First, it appears Brock has already forgotten about the whole almost dying at the bottom of the ocean thing from a few days prior. And two, what exactly does he mean by saying he wasted it? Yeah, I have no idea. They seem to have a pretty adventurous summer. Right, exactly. And, you know, listening to this, it's making it kind of difficult to try and pinpoint the exact time that has passed during the show. I guess that means Ash went off on his journey in spring because it wasn't summer yet. Yeah, yeah, I would I would probably guess that. So I, I just thought it was something interesting trying to figure out, you know, the exact time that's passed because they haven't gotten very far if they've gone almost, you know, three or four months. Exactly. Plus, you know... The whole almost dying at the bottom of the ocean thing couldn't have happened much more than a week before this, and Brock's already like, I never want to see land again. It's really great how they managed to get over trauma like that. It is. I mean, just a couple episodes ago, they were swimming in the ocean. You know, the ocean they almost died in. Right. I would never touch an ocean again if I almost died in it. Ash responds to Brock complaining by saying that they had a whole summer full of adventures. And then Brock clarifies by pointing out that he is actually sad because bikini season is over and he will have to wait another year to meet a girl. Apparently, you can only meet girls if they are in bikinis. This further solidifies my thought that Brock doesn't have the best social skills. Also, didn't he just get done hosting a bikini contest? Yeah, he did. I mean, he's seen plenty of girls in bikinis in the last couple days. Uh, and, but, you know, I kind of interpreted his complaining as it being over more so than he didn't get his fill thus far. Okay, so, you know... It's like me with he, pizza. You could never have enough pizza. True. So, you know, he just always wants the cup to runneth over. Yes, exactly. That's kind of how I saw it. We then change scenes again to see that Team Rocket is still floating in a bucket that is attached to the ship as it is sailing. Meowth says, we are really at the end of our rope. Ugh, that was a bad pun. The whole group seems sad because they have to ride in the bucket as opposed to the ship itself, and Jesse reminds them that they have no money and that this beats having to swim to Maiden's Peak. I really would like to say that I like the continuity from the end of last episode. Because last episode ended with Team Rocket floating in the bucket. They could have easily just used that as a gag and moved on, but they decided to keep them towing behind the ship. Yeah, exactly. They definitely continued it. We then see that the ship is arriving in Maiden's Peak. A voice comes over the loudspeaker and says that they want to welcome the travelers arriving from Porta Vista. The announcer also says that he wants to invite them all to attend the Summer's End Festival, which is now in progress. The camera then pans over the festival, and it gives me real county fair vibes, Jeff, which also makes sense because those always occur at the end of the summer as well. You know, minus all the, you know, drunk upper middle-aged men riding around on golf carts that you're <laughs> prone to seeing at county fairs. I understand what you're... from Coming from Iowa, We I understand what you're saying. Oh, yes, definitely. I'd be curious to see. They are definitely the same in Nebraska as well. I'd be curious to see if that's just kind of a going trend nationwide. Ash is excited by the festival, and the party agrees that they should check it out. Brock still seems sad about the bikini thing from before, but then he notices a young woman with purplish or maybe light pink hair standing at the edge of a dock looking sad. She has the same red flower in her hair as the exorcist statue from before. Ooh, boy. Brock thinks she is beautiful, but before he can act in a predictably creepy way, the crowd leaving the ship runs him over. The woman appears to change into a ghastly and disappears. Pikachu was watching this entire time as this happens, but it is unclear if he saw, you know, what happened as he seemed to be perplexed. So, I get the feeling later on in the episode that Pikachu didn't see the ghost woman change into a ghastly, but who knows, maybe he was just keeping that to himself. 
After this brief trampling, Brock looks up and exclaims in a disappointed way that the woman is gone. Ash tells him to cheer up because they are at a festival. It doesn't surprise me that Brock is mourning over a girl he doesn't even know. No. That's just Brock. No, it shouldn't surprise anyone. It's just what Brock does. At this point, we see Team Rocket peek their heads over the dock and also notice the festival. Apparently, their plan is to go around and pick up change that people will predictably drop. Just then, James looks over and sees the same young woman from before. James reacts in a similar fashion to Brock, but before he can do anything, Jesse smacks him and tells him they're going to the festival to find some money. James looks back, and the woman is gone. At this point, we change scenes to the festival itself. There's a belly dancer and confetti flying everywhere, and everyone seems to be really happy. And I've never really been able to, like, pinpoint the theme of this fair, because, like... At the beginning, when they panned over it, it had county fair vibes, and now it kind of looks almost like a, and I am not well versed in, like, is gypsy the correct term for it? Gypsy culture? I mean, I don't think it looked like a gypsy culture. I didn't, I guess I didn't pay attention and notice the belly dancer. I was just thinking as a typical, it looked like the, not fairs, but like the festivals I saw when I was in Japan. Okay, yeah, I mean, the belly dancer gave me some like gypsy vibes and like some of the, and I do not know if that's the PC term for it, I have never even met. I, I know that one term for them is travelers, but you know the idea. The, the, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, like the belly dancer and some of the costumes in this particular scene kind of gave me that vibe. It reminded me of like the beginning from the original Wolfman when they have that like gypsy festival is what they called it. It, it had that similar vibe, but yeah, definitely later on it more trends towards the Japanese. So everyone is really happy as these belly dancer dances around and confetti's flying everywhere, except for Brock. He is still upset that woman from the dock disappeared before he could creep her out. But all of a sudden, a short old woman comes up behind him and startles him. She warns him to watch out for the young beauty or he will meet a cruel fate, but this doesn't matter but this doesn't deter Brock, and he says he still wants to meet her. Misty chimes in and says that the beautiful young girl the old woman is referring to must be her. But the old woman says that she isn't talking about a scrawny little blabbermouth like you. So, I have uh, just a deep sense of joy every time someone puts Misty in her place. Yeah, Misty needs to be knocked down a peg, occasionally. Ash agrees that she is scrawny, and Misty gets mad and smacks him. She says she doesn't have to stand around and be insulted. Misty then grabs them and drags them away as Brock says that the cruelest fate would be to never see that girl again. He is still obsessed with this woman who is standing on the edge of a dock looking sad, and I have really honestly have no idea why. We flash back to the fair where we see Team Rocket on their hands and knees with a magnifying glass looking for change. They are upset because they haven't found any change, and suddenly James spots a penny and scoops it up. Just as he does, the old woman from before comes up and tells him that he is up to no good, and she sees no good in his future either. James questions her, asking if it will be the police or the FBI, and she explains that she actually sees a young, beautiful woman who will lead him to a cruel fate. James responds by saying that he doesn't need a fortune teller to know that. Women always cause him trouble, and he calls it a curse. And I'm not <laughs> hating on James here, Jeff, but I just want to say that I didn't really get the whole likes women vibe from James so far in this series. Like, he just, you know, the 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 bikini cross-dressing thing, like, all of that. All of that kind of led me to believe that, you know, maybe he didn't really bat for that team. Well, yeah, and, I mean, even the bikini, that's not the first time he cross-dressed. He also cross-dressed as a schoolgirl before they went on to say and. Yeah. I guess I guess James is just kind of a complex dude, and he can do what he wants. Yeah, I mean, James, maybe maybe he's on both sides of the fence. You never know. I don't know if we will ever know. Probably not. But an interesting thing to note from this scene is that the penny in the Japanese version is a 5 yen coin. Uh, when the camera pans out and James is holding it, you can actually see... So a 5 yen coin in Japanese has a square hole in the middle of it, so when the camera pans away, you can see the hole, which makes no sense from an American viewer because it was a penny. Why is there a hole in a penny? Right. Okay, that makes sense. So did they, like, reanimate the penny when they did the dub or something? 
Yeah, so you, up close, it was a really nice looking penny. And actually, if you looked at it, it looked kind of out of place. It wasn't in the same art style or anything. Okay. So uh, it looked really out of place. And so when they pulled away, they didn't reanimate when James was holding it up because it was so far away. But you could clearly see the hole that is in normally in a five yen coin. I got you. That's interesting. After this exchange where James says that women always cause him trouble and calls it a curse, Jesse questions him, asking who he means, but just then Officer Jenny walks up and introduces herself. She says that she knows what they are doing, and Team Rocket begins to scream. But Officer Jenny explains that she knows that they are just being good citizens and picking up loose change that people have lost. She tells them that lost money must be reported to, to the police and takes James's penny. She also invites them to go to the police station with her to file a report. Team T Rocket actually declines and then runs away. So, have we seen a competent Officer Jenny throughout this series yet? No, not yet. So, yeah. So, this Jenny, I thought, was also really incompetent. A really incompetent police officer. I mean, having them go all the way to the station just to file a report for a penny? Right. But you also gotta kinda wonder, like, uh, how busy are they? On a day-to-day -day basis. I can't imagine a whole lot of, like, really horrible stuff is happening on a daily basis in this town. No, but you think that people would like their tax dollars to go to something a little better. Hey, maybe that's why they only have one cop. <laughs> that, that could be. You know, one cop who's the same as every other cop everywhere else. We then change scenes to a shrine with a priest. The priest explaining... The priest is explaining that they will be displaying a 2,000-year-old painting that hangs within the Shrine of the Maiden. He explains that once each year, the painting is removed from the shrine and displayed to the public. He then unveils the painting, and it is this creepy-looking black-and-white painting of the same woman that Brock and James have spotted. So, I want to take a moment to say that I hate old paintings, and old pictures for that matter. I just think they look really creepy, and I hate looking at them. In fact, Tyler, this whole scene was making me think of the pair of paintings we have that are probably haunted. Yes, Jeff and I have matching paintings that are probably haunted. We got them from a deserted room in our over 100-year-old dorm building we lived in. Yeah, so long story short, they were shutting down the dorm building. They were turning it into office buildings. So Tyler and I went to say goodbye to the hall director there, the person who was in charge of the dorm, because she was leaving too because her dorm no longer existed. So she was like, hey, you what? So she was giving us a final tour. We were like some of the last people to see it as a dorm building. Right, we were. And so she was giving us a tour and she would goes, hey, here's some rooms you're never allowed to go into when you guys were living here. So she opens it up and it looks like it was going to be just a normal dorm room. But we walk in, there's no tile or carpet. It's just wood floor, brick walls, which all the walls were plaster and these two paintings hanging in this room. Right, definitely gave some Silent Hill vibes. Yeah, and so she goes, do you guys want these paintings? And we're like, oh yeah. So <laughs> we probably have a pair of haunted paintings in our houses. And they appear to be like, actually like, they're not reprints, like they're original oil paintings from somewhere. And I've tried to look up like the painter, but I I've had no luck. I don't know if you can see it, Jeff, but in our Zoom call that we're talking on, I actually have it hanging behind my bed, or behind my head. Oh, I do kind of see it. Uh, my painting is in my wife's office because she won't let me put it in the main part of the house. It's probably because it's haunted by the devil. Probably, and I just don't have space down in my game room. It doesn't fit the vibe. Uh, it doesn't fit the vibe either, but Jeff, we had a deal that we would always hang these paintings up in our houses. And it is hanging up in my house, just in my wife's office. <laughs> Uh, so if it goes after anyone, it's going after her, I guess. Yeah, that's honestly probably the best scenario for you. So after this uh, creepy-looking black-and-white painting of the same woman Brock and James has spotted is, is shown, both Team Rocket and Ash and his party are in attendance for the unveiling, and Brock and James are both surprised to see that the woman is the painting in the painting is the same as the woman they saw before. Rather than being creeped out, however, they both begin to blush and say that this is the girl of their dreams as they walk up the steps to the painting. Fortunately, the priest stops them and says that the woman in the painting died over 2,000 years ago. Apparently, she was in love with a brave and handsome young man, but he left to fight in a war, and the maiden said that she would wait for him forever. 
Well, the man never returned, and she waited on top of the rock for a long time afterwards. Eventually, her body then turned into stone. So it appears that this statue is not actually a statue. It is the rockified version of the woman's body. And I have to wonder, did this guy die in the war or use this as a chance to bounce? Because obviously this woman is a tad clingy. Yeah, dying in a war is a good excuse to never come back, so... Heck yeah, he's probably like, this is my chance. He's probably like a quartermaster, like, counted bed sheets the entire time, and then when it was time to go home, he's like, oh, I'm gonna bounce. Here, send her this letter that says I died. <laughs> yeah, that'd be the way to get away. This story doesn't deter them, however, and Brock asks where the ash is located. The priest tells them that the rock is not far from the shrine. We then change scenes to Ash and his party standing and looking at the rock body of this woman. Brock says that it is the most beautiful rock he has ever seen, which is ironic because his name is Brock and he uses rock-type Pokemon. Maybe he has a thing for rocks. I don't know. You think this makes Geodude and Onyx a little sad? Um, or relieved that his attention is off of them for a while. Who knows? <laughs> We also see Team Rocket standing opposite to them and staring at the same rock. James seems mesmerized as well. Both Brock and James seem very well convinced that they will have a relationship with this woman, even though she is dead and a rock. James wants to steal the rock, but Meowth suggests that they steal the painting instead, since it is probably worth a lot of money. We then see that James is hanging over the edge of the cliff. Jeffy Jesse grabs him, and they both fall into the water below. Meowth responds by saying that Team Rocket is really slipping. <sighs> okay. We then have another scene change, and at this point, it is now nighttime. Ash explains to Brock that no matter how long he waits there, it's still just a rock. Brock won't leave, though, and says that he wants to stay. Ash and Misty agree to let him stay there while they head back to the festival. They plan to meet where they are staying later that night, which is the Pokemon Center in town. Yeah, and this does not seem like the best plan. Brock obviously isn't in the best state of mind right now, and leaving him is not a very good idea. Yeah, you gotta look out for your friends when they're having moments like this. Yeah, we always look out for each other, right, Tyler? Uh, yeah. Well, tried to. We try. We may not be successful, but we try. Yeah, that is very true. Like that time that we had had, uh... Too many adult beverages, and you decided that you were going to escort me down to my apartment, and then I had to escort you back, so we showed back up at your place, and everyone was like, why? In, their f in, in my defense, our friends made a horrible decision of letting me, because we were the, we were the le most inebriated ones there, and they're like, oh sure, we'll let Jeff walk Tyler to his apartment. And then as we... <laughs> so, this is going to go way, but I have to tell the story now. So as I'm taking Tyler to his apartment, we get in the elevator because I lived on the third floor. You lived on the first. Right. Or I lived on the second. We had to take an elevator to get to your, your room. And so we're in the elevator and then I go, Tyler, what if now you escort me back to my place? Cause I can't get back. And so I just remember as well, Go into your room, turn around, walking back, and we're just giggling the whole way because we think we are the most hilarious people in the world. Yeah, the people uh, at your apartment still were not impressed when I showed back up. Also, you left out the part that I kicked the elevator panel on the way down. I didn't yeah. want to push the button, so I kicked it. That was yeah, bad. Don't we, ever we, do that, kids. Don't ever do that. Don't. Uh, alcohol is not cool. No, it's bad. And Nicole was really mad at us when I brought you back. Nicole because, was very mad. Yeah, because she had to bring you back to your room. Yes, it was overall a very annoying situation. But we tried, Jeff. We tried to look out for one another, unlike what Ash and his party are doing for Brock here. Yeah. Later on, we see Ash and Misty waiting at the Pokemon Center where they are staying, and they are worried because it hit curfew and Brock wasn't back yet. Surprise, surprise. They want to go look for him, but Nurse Joy stops them and tells them that it is bedtime and they have to go to bed. The whole place locks up on them. So this brought up a question I had about the Pokemon world in general. I'm wondering if this curfew is for all towns or just this town specifically. I mean, you can't just lock them in the Pokemon Center if they... Isn't that technically kidnapping? 
it, it definitely is technically kidnapping. Like they wanted to leave and they were forced to not leave and their children kidnapping. Yeah. And she, it isn't like the mom said you're in charge of them. Right. This was just random nurse joy. And who sleeps in a Pokemon center? I like, mean, there's you'll hotels. Fi- you'll find throughout the whole series. That's where I think they sleep because you don't have to pay anything to stay at a Pokemon center. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Good thing this doesn't go on the American system. It probably would have cost them $100,000 to sleep in the Pokemon <laughs> Center for a night. Prob- probably, but you'll find this throughout the whole series. The deeper we get, they they sleep at Pokemon Centers all the time. They did it the other night, too. Remember when they found Charmander, they were in a Pokemon Center. Right, they did. That was a nice one, too. It looked like a fancy lodge. We then change scenes yet again and head back to the Shrine. Team Rocket is asleep hanging from a tree in their sleeping bags. The alarm goes off and Meowth wakes them, saying that it is time to steal the painting. And I just wanted to know how they slept like that. That does not make sense. Yeah, hanging from a tree in your sleeping bag? I don't get it. Before Jesse and James wake up, however, the wind begins to roar and the doors to the shrine swing open. We see a ghostly figure of a woman emerge from the shrine as Meowth watches on in terror. Meowth screams and the ghost sees him. She emits some sort of cloudy beam thing, and this puts Meowth to sleep. She then hovers up to the tree and says, My love, I'm waiting for you, and James emerges from his sleep. He sees her and says, It's you, so it really was you. And James is about to be devoured by a love ghost or something. (laughs) The scene changes again, and this time we see Brock still sitting and staring at the statue. Suddenly, the ghost comes up behind Brock and says she has been waiting for him for a long time. Brock also says, it's you. It's really you, just like James did. And the ghost nods in agreement. Morning comes, and we see Ash and Misty looking for Brock at the shrine. Jesse and Meowth are also there looking for James. It is the morning now, and both of their friends are gone. And then we go into our Who's That Pokemon segment. Who's That Pokemon? And our Who's That Pokemon for this week is Ghastly. We saw him shortly at the beginning of this episode, and in Japanese he is known as Ghost, which is just Ghost, but without the T. Well, that's kind of lame. Yeah, so, some basic information about Ghastly. He's numbered 92 in the Pokedex. He is a Ghost and Poison type. He is 4 foot 3 inches tall, and he weighs 0.2 pounds. Uh, and he is known as the Gas Pokemon, and he evolves into Haunter at level 25. Alright, some origins about Ghastly. His name origin. Ghastly may be a combination of gas and ghastly like ghost or dreadfully frightening. Makes perfect sense. Uh, his Japanese name origin, Ghost, is the, is shortened form of ghost and may also incorporate gas into its name. And then what is Ghastly based off of? Ghastly seems to be based on general ghosts and spirits as depicted by cartoons or even a, a will-o'-wisp. It may also have been based on the Japanese yokai Sogen Bai, the decapitated head of a monk whose head is doomed to wander the earth, consumed by fire. Its poison type is most likely a reference to poisonous or polluted gases. Ghastly's Biology Ghastly has no true form. Due to 95% of its body being poisonous gas, however, it consistently appears as black spherical Pokemon surrounded by a purple haze. It has a wide pink mouth and two visible fangs. Though its eyes seem to extend past its round body, visible eyelids surround them. It produces a faint sweet smell. The toxic gas surrounded the main body can induce fainting and suffocation, and it is capable of enshrouding an enemy of any size. All right, it's so, a wicked, scary Pokemon. Yeah, so just wait. We're getting into the Pokedex entries, and they'll tell you how frightening coming up on a Ghastly would be. So, red and blue states, almost invisible, this gaseous Pokemon cloaks the target and puts it to sleep without notice. Uh, Pokemon Yellow says, said to appear in decrepit, deserted buildings. It has no real shape as it appears to be made of gas. A uh, Pokemon Silver states, its thin body is made of gas. It can envelop an opponent of any size and cause suffocation. So yeah, so Ghastly just suffocates you. Yeah, that's unpleasant. Uh, Pokemon Crystal says, 
It wraps its opponents in its gas-like body, slowly weakening its prey by poisoning it through the skin. So not only is it suffocating you, it's poisoning you as it goes. Well, that seems like overkill. A uh, Pokemon Fire Red says, A being that exists as a thin gas, it can topple an Indian elephant by enveloping the prey in two seconds. Why specifically an Indian elephant? I don't know. But two seconds it can take down this elephant. Okay, okay, that's disturbing. A uh, Pokemon Sun said, Should a strange light be seen flickering in an abandoned building? Ghastly is lurking there. Pokemon Ultra Sun says, It's said that gas emanating from a graveyard was possessed by the grievances of the deceased and thus became a Pokemon. And then the last one is Pokemon Ultra Moon, which says, Poisonous gas comprises 95% of its body. It's said that the remaining 5% is made up of the souls of those who died from the gas. And then some trivia about Ghastly. So, in the Pokemon Red and Blue Beta, Ghastly's prototype name was Spirit. I think Ghastly's so much better. And then, no other Pokemon have the same type combination as Ghastly in its evolved forms. So they're the only Poison Ghost Pokemon. And, the, and before we get out of the Who's That Pokemon segment, I just want to say it's kind of history here. So, Ghost Pokemon are naturally strong against Psychic Pokemon, and they'll even tell you that in the games. But when you were playing Pokemon Red and Blue, do not even think about taking a Ghastly Haunter or Gengar against the Psychic Gem, because... They are all poison type as well, and Psychic is strong against poison type. Okay, well that is definitely good to know. Yeah, so, they say, and so, in a couple episodes from now, we're going to come across this where they get a ghost to help them with the Psychic Gem, but it doesn't help. (laughs) It does help in the anime, but it shouldn't. More anime physics. But that's our Who's That Pokemon? Who's That Pokemon? Truly fantastic. What a creepy little Pokemon this is. Yeah, for sure. I mean, especially the part where it says the other 5% is made up of the souls of the deceased that it killed. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're going to find out just how uh, wicked these things are here in just a sec. After the Who's That Pokemon, we go back to the uh, building by the creepy rock statue where... Ash and, and and his party and Team Rocket, they're looking for James and Brock. They're gone. Um, apparently, they've been devoured by this uh, ghost. Ash and Jesse run into one another, and Jesse tries to do her little Team Rocket Pokemon thing, like their Team Rocket poem thing, I should say, but it doesn't work out very well. She starts, like, uh, awkwardly completing it by herself, and at the end... You know, so she's, like, filling in James's parts with her own voice changed. But then at the end, they hear James. He flies out of the building next to the rock, and Brock follows behind him. It appears that they have been dumped in this building after a long night with this ghost woman. And they are both really disoriented from whatever happens. I do really wonder, what happened if you catch my drift? This is a children's show, so we will never know. That is true, but I mean, they, she took them and was gone with them all night, and now in the morning, they seem very disoriented. It's just this whole thing. Just then, the old woman approaches and says that everything has gone as she predicted. She says that these two have seen the ghost of the maiden, and Brock and James begin to hug. Ash yells that they are possessed, and Pikachu shocks them. This appears to break them of their spell, at least momentarily, and they are both back to normal. So this is like one of my favorite lines from Brock. So Pikachu shocks Brock. And I actually laugh at this because Brock is shocked and goes, who am I? I am Brock. Mm -hmm. As he nods his head. (laughs) Like he just now remembered. Yeah. The old woman explains that this happens all the time. Men are lured by the ghost of the maiden and end up in that building by the statue mumbling like idiots. Those were her exact words. I'm not really sure why she didn't just say this earlier, but I guess that would have been less cinematic. Brock says he doesn't care as long as he can be with the Maiden, and Ash realizes that Brock really hasn't snapped out of it fully yet. James says he is scared, and the old woman gives him them stickers, saying that they are anti-ghost stickers. Ash asks what the catch is, and the old woman explains that these stickers cost money. They then pay her money and begin sticking the stickers all all over the building uh, they are in for protection. Yeah, and in the Japanese original, the stickers are called Ofuda, 
which are slips of paper from the Shinto religion, and kind of like they use them as anti-ghost stickers, they are originally used for specific reasons like getting rid of ghosts, protection, and other things like that. Okay, so that makes way more sense, because that was like anti-ghost stickers? Didn't seem to make a whole lot of sense to me, but that, that definitely puts it in perspective. After they are done preparing their building and warding it off from the evil to come, nightfall comes and the wind begins to pick up. The old woman says, she's here. Just then the ghost enters the building and Brock gets happy to see her. James is just scared at this point, so it appears that James is more snapped out of it than Brock. It doesn't appear that the stickers are working and Brock and James get pulled into the air toward the ghost who is now hovering by the statue. Ash and Misty grab onto Brock and Brock tells them to let go. James is also floating towards the ghost when, just then, Jesse actually shoots a bazooka at the ghost and it flies through it. Jesse tells the ghost that it doesn't have a ghost of a chance, which is honestly a real stretch of a pun, but this does, however, stop the pull and uh, they are no longer being pulled towards the ghost. Jesse explains that she doesn't like girls like who like her who are always waiting around for a man. The ghost then explains that Jesse cannot interfere because she has been waiting for so long. Suddenly the wind begins to howl and some ghost skulls come flying out. Ash tries to identify them with the Pokédex, but they aren't recognized, at least at first. As these ghosty, ghostly skulls continue to fly around, suddenly the Pokédex recognizes them as a ghastly and explains that they are a ghastly, are ghostly and hypnotic Pokémon. The ghost woman then says that they have finally figured it out. This whole time, it's been ghastly in disguise. We then see that the old woman was also ghastly this whole time. Yeah, and it's interesting to note that this ghastly can talk. So far, you know, the only talking Pokemon we have seen is Meowth. And then we see Ghastly in later episodes, and they say their name like any other Pokemon, so I don't know why this one is so special that it can talk. It kind of would have ruined the intensity of the moment if they were just going, Gasler, Gasler. Yeah, yeah, I I understand. So I wish they would have just made it so Ghastly can talk, but then I guess that they just didn't want to do it that way. One could say it was a Ghastly error of the anime to do this. <laughs> After this epic reveal is done, Ash challenges the Ghastly to a battle. Ash sends out Pikachu, but the Ghastly says that its hypnotic powers also work on Pokemon and sends a giant mousetrap out that begins chasing Pikachu. Meowth then jumps in and says a mousetrap won't work on him, and he charges the Ghastly. But Ghastly sends out a toy for Meowth to play with, and this successfully uh, distracts Meowth away from his attack. This leads to a whole succession, and I, I was typing it all out, but I was like, I'm not going to explain each one of these. But basically, we just go through this whole sequence where everyone is sending out all their Pokemon, and every single one of them is countered with some, like, crazy hypnotic thing that uh, stops them. And, you know, all the Pokemon ended up getting defeated. Yeah, so I put two in here that I wanted to note. I don't remember how many more there were, but uh, when Jesse sends out her Ekans, the Ghastly changes into a Mongoose because mongoose are sworn enemies of snakes. Uh, right. This, and this is actually going to be used with the relationship between Saviper and Zangoose later on. Um, two Pokemon, I believe, they go in the Hoenn region, Ruby and Sapphire. I'm not sure on that. Uh, also, when the mongoose comes out, he goes, it's dinner time. But in the Japanese version, he actually just says mongoose, like a Pokemon would say their own name. See, now that would have just ruined the whole moment for me. I'd have been like, episode ruined, click off. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm glad they had to say something. It really shouldn't have just said anything at all, but, you know. The other hypnotic trap that happens when Ash sends out Bulbasaur and Squirtle, the Ghastly turns into Venusaur and Blastoise. They then do this Wonder Twins type dance. You know, they're like, with our powers united. And then they turn into what is known as a Venus Stoice. And the appearance of Venusaurus, if you don't know what that is, they merged Blastoise and Venusaur, uh, sparked many playground rumors, and people thought that you could actually get him in the game. Well, they were wrong. They were. The same people are still probably trying to move that truck by the SSN to get Mew. Right, absolutely. So this whole, like, ghastly thing, this whole ghastly thing, I did not mean <laughs> to do that fun. 
This whole thing involving Ghastly goes on for a while, and all the Pokemon are defeated, and Ash says that it is no use because the Ghastly is too strong. Misty then pulls out a cross. Yes, you're hearing that right. A cross, a stake, and a hammer. And the Ghastly asks her if it looks like a vampire or something. But just then, the bells begin to ring, and Ghastly becomes upset, saying that it hates sunlight. As the sun rises, Ghost Ghastly fades away, saying that it will be back next year at the festival. Yeah, and I will say the cross definitely surprised me as well, bringing in that religious iconography there. Yeah, I know. I was, like, taken aback by it. I'm like, whoa! Yeah, though I did like it when the sunlight came out. Ghastly's like, I may not be a vampire, but I still hate the sunlight. Which... Yes. Brings up a question. Wasn't he out in the sunlight as the maiden and the old woman before? Yes, yes, he most definitely was. Again, another ghastly error. You're too much today. I know. My wife says I'm too much every day. That's why I have to hang out in the basement. (laughs) We then see the festival wrapping up with all the visitors sending out little boats. So the ghastly has faded away and says it'll be back next year for the festival. And so it changes scenes, and we see the festival wrapping up with the visitors sending out the little boats with candles to help guide the spirits back home if they are lost. As this happens, it is nighttime again, and we see Ghastly talking with the actual ghost of the maiden. So it is a real ghost. She thanks Ghastly for its help, and Ghastly says that it enjoys keeping old legends alive and making money during the festival, presumably from selling these anti-ghost stickers, which is ironic. We see Brock standing by the statue, still longing for the maiden. He says, if only you were 2,000 years younger, maybe next year. I sure hope he doesn't try to go back next year. We then flash back to the festival where there is a party going on and Team Rocket are playing some drums. Everyone is wearing like these traditional looking Japanese style clothing and Misty comes up to Ash wearing hers and Ash is briefly like taken aback like, whoa. And then she asks Ash to dance, which I did not understand. Yeah, I think their kimonos is what they're wearing. Kimonos? Okay. They all begin dancing as the announcer narrator explains that there is always next year for Brock. And to be continued comes across the screen. And I'm going to say, Tyler, this was definitely a filler episode, but it is probably one of my favorite filler episodes. Oh, yes, this is a great episode, despite clearly being a filler and some of the, you know, ghastly plot holes. Yeah, but it it was it was really fun. I enjoyed the horror aspect of it, you know, not to get too scary because this is a kid's show, but it was a definite change of pace after the last, what, five episodes of them being in the ocean. Absolutely. I loved this episode. And if you want to tell us what you thought of the episode, make sure you tell us on Twitter at Pokemon Snapshot, or you can email us at thepokemonsnapshot at gmail.com. So, Tyler, are there any more comments from you before we sign off? No, I'm uncharacteristically commentless right now. Wow, I can't believe it. But, please, join us next week when we will be watching episode 21, Bye Bye Butterfree. That is going to be so sad. Oh.